Good evening. I'll give you 10 to 1 you like tonight's program. 10 to 1. But first, here's Ted with the rundown. Brace yourself, BC. In a few short months, the provincial government will offer floating gambling games on one of the BC ferry runs and legal casinos in towns that want them. Where will this all lead? Tonight on Webster, a special feature on one of the unpleasant byproducts of gambling, the compulsive gambler. Where do you turn if you spend more than you earn? There are certain inalienable rights and options guaranteed to all consumers, even those heavily in debt. Later in the studio with Webster, Harry Atkinson, Provincial Director of Consumer Credit and Debtor Assistance. But first of all, let me put my position very clearly. I do not approve of government gambling. I think lotteries are a phony tax on the poor. $350 million collected in BC each year. Half of it goes to the government, half of it goes to profits, and we've got all kinds of silly people who spend their hard-earned money and scratch and win and buying 649 tickets. And one of Van der Zam's promises, one you can really see clearly, is that he wants to stop all the gambling money in BC from going to Nevada. I'd rather see it in Nevada and keep the mafia in Nevada. Meanwhile, in my predilection against gambling, I decided to look at some casualties of compulsive gambling. And here they are. Gambling. You were a uh, heavy gambler for many years. Just add up your principal losses for me. Your principal losses. Well, principal losses, I would say if you made about $700 every two weeks and you were broke from day to day, you know, for an amount of two years, you could add that up. How about your house? I sold that, and the proceeds from that went into gambling, horses. I played a little bit of the horses, but cards was a bigger factor of it. How much did you lose from your house proceeds? Oh, I would say about $3,000. About 3000 bucks. Not big money. No. But the average person doesn't know where people gamble. Where do they gamble? Well, it's the social clubs, you know, the uh, racetrack, that's, that is the biggest one. That's where people really take the baths. You know, I'd, there's nothing more I'd like to see as those racetracks closed down. Second of all, the card clubs, houses. Uh, the card clubs, by and large, are uh, legal. Oh, yeah, they're legal. They take, what, a dollar, half a legal rake off from the table. Yeah. Yeah, but what was your first gambling? How, when did you begin to gamble? How old were you? Me, yeah, I was about 21. Mm -hmm. I started out playing crib, believe it or not, at 10 cents a game. Double for skunks, a whole 20 cents. And it progressed up to 50 cents, up to a dollar. Some East Indian friends of mine taught me the, how to play this three-card secret that they play, and, you know, that got me started good. Then guys from where I worked would invite me over to uh, play cards with them. So it was actually a progressive disease. It just didn't happen like that. It kept up and up and up, and finally I noticed that uh, I was broke. I was addicted. I had a high. I couldn't worry about women or going out with my girlfriends or anything like that. If I had money to play with, I'd go and play cards, and I'd go and see them when I was broke. Did it run in your family? Uh, I talked to uh, my father about it. He said he had a little bit of a problem there, but he learned his lesson. He went for other things, other sins. <laughs> did you Did you never get married? Uh, did I ever get M married? Married. I was married. What happened to your wife? Because of the gambling? Yeah, she noticed that the money was getting a little short. You know, that caused arguments. But... You said that gambling gave you a high. It did. Did anything else give you a high? Well, yeah. You know, if there was a big game on, while well, you would uh, want to do some uppers. You know, and it's, it's quite a fear. I can tell you actually what I've done is coke and uh, whatever I could else get my hands on that would give me that high. So I could play 48 hours straight. And then uh, I go home and swallow a half a bottle of Valiums to uh, get myself to go to sleep. Would you call yourself? So I did that for about a period of three years. Did you? The coke must have cost you a fortune too. Oh yeah. 
you know, that, uh, that's where the lying and, you know, to me, I became a professional liar instead of a professional card player. Now, did you ever deal with loan sharks? Or did any of your friends ever deal with loan sharks? There are quite a few loan sharks around town. <clears throat> I've had a few uh, scaring experiences, you know, and they really scared me. And I said to myself, I'll quit, I'll quit. But all I did was go out and borrow the mo money from a good friend to pay them. Then about a week later, I was back at it again. You know? What kind of uh, deal would you get on a loan shark if you wanted, say, 500 bucks to go into a game? Well, depending on the person, I'd say that you're looking at uh, if you borrowed $500, like you say, they had wanted over a week's period, two weeks at the most. So you'd be paying back for anywhere from 50 to 100 bucks. On that? On that. That's uh, big, heavy interest. But yeah. you, you always, did you always manage to make your payments? Well, big cheat and steal, you know, I'd pay them off somehow. Have you got a beating? I live it on a day-by-day -day basis. You know, today I'm not going to gamble. You know, tomorrow, well, I'll look after that when it gets here. Yeah, but uh, well, how much money have you lost in all in all these years of gambling? Well, I'd have to say paycheck. about paycheck. Paycheck after paycheck after paycheck. So you're living from hand to mouth if you're gambling. Right. I and had two you, jobs. Yeah, you're running two jobs. You had two jobs. Yeah. And drove cab on the weekend. Yeah. Just to keep things together. Yeah. The government in BC seems determined to bring in legalized casinos of some kind. We don't know who would run them, but what do you think would be the effect on our fairly civilized little community? Well, I think it would be devastating. You know, like, look what happened to me. You know, I mean, before I buy some groceries, I go and use it you know, to play cards. It's going to happen. You can't keep it away, but it's going to hurt a lot of families, and I think that Gamblers Anonymous is going to be full of people if they... Uh, what about the heavies? Up. Well, they'll be here. That goes along with gambling. They're, they'll be there. If there's a dollar for them to be made, they'll be into it. And that means drugs? Drugs, loan sharking. You know, it's, they're going to be there. It's inevitable. I've seen it in smaller times, you know. If on a big scale basis like that, you can bet your, if you would like to play, bet. I don't. They'll be there. What's your advice to people who stick the money into the Lotto 649 or any of these other Western Expresses, or even the bingo? You can become a bingo fiend too, you know. Well, several people that are. Mm -hmm. You know, they go down there and they uh, buy $10 worth of cards. You know, then they phone me up and ask me if, if I can loan them $5 so they can buy their pets some food, you know, and this kind of stuff. <laughs> Not that I'm all ago in the bingo. <laughs> it's true, I know, it makes you laugh, but it happens. Yeah, no. You know, there's a, to me, I played the rich part of gambling. You know, to bingo and your lotteries, like you know yourself, those damn scratch and win and what have you, is a poor man's tax. You know, I, and I hate to see that. So now you live on the old AA thing. What is it? God grant me serenity, serenity prayer, yeah. to accept the things I cannot change and the wisdom or the courage of something to know mm -hmm. what I can. Right. Well, stay away from the cards. Oh, I will. And the coke. The Van der Zijm government is so strictly moral on other grounds that I feel it is direct hypocrisy for the social credit government to go for this all-out gambling. There's no doubt about it, they want gambling casinos and communities that want them. Whistler, as it happened, turned them down. And I'm not suggesting they're going to bring in massive gambling, although there's a danger of it. I was down in Atlantic City last year, and that is one of the most disgusting places on the face of North America. It has the worst kind of gambling with the mafia and all the scum that can possibly co be collected in one particular place. So maybe I'm kind of bending the, uh, the, the, the whole position a little bit strongly, but I was determined to show to you what gambling can do to individuals. Now let's look at this couple and their particular problems. Tell me about some of the troubles and problems that you went through before along came Gammon on? Well, it was just that 
because of his gambling, um, he wouldn't come home a lot of, you know, when he was supposed to for dinner time or, or sometimes for maybe 48 hours in a row. Um, he would promise that this would be the last time he wouldn't gamble again. Mm -hmm. And I know at the time he really meant it, and yet he would find himself back out there. Um, money was being spent that we couldn't afford to spend. Time was being spent away from the home and children. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's a devastating thing to live with. Well, you, you must have known when you... When did you first realize that you were a compulsive gambler, just like some people are compulsive smokers or compulsive drinkers? Well, honestly, I don't think I realized it until after I got in the program. How did it or start? Or admit it to it. Yeah, admit to it. How, how did your problem start? Well, I think it started as a young kid. I went caddying and the big caddies, got, whether it was throwing coins against the wall, uh, bl blackjack, poker, anything they played, I couldn't stay away from them. How old did you be then? Nine years old. <laughs> Nine years old. You were caddying for a dollar or a dollar and a half, and you would use that for gambling in the caddy shack. Six bits was our uh, fee, and if you was lucky, it got up to a buck and a half. But even in those days, uh, I had all the tendencies that I was crooked. Uh, I had two brothers, the three of us caddied, and uh, my mother had three bowls that we put her money in. Mine was always empty, and I could always reach a hand up in the other two bowls and help myself to something that didn't belong to me. Was that as crooked as you ever got? No, I wrote some bad checks after. I even got to the point at the end of it, uh, I was kiting different uh, financial institutions, one against the other. I always had uh, big stacks of papers because sometimes I would make three loans, four loans in a month. It was confidential, no mail. I couldn't allow mail to go home because I was having my check mailed home. She would get it, and this was the way I was financing it. I was even going to, because some mail came home from the finance company, I was going to sue them for what I owed and thought I would get off of the hook that way. Because that was how sick my thinking was. They broke your confidentiality and sent the mail to the house and your mm -hmm. wife found out about it. What did you do when you found what No, did you... I, I used to go home and get the mail. I would catch the mailman before it got in, in case would, there was something wrong. He'd go up the road and meet the mailman on the street to get the mail, eh? Well, if necessary, or he would be at the front door when it came in. And you wouldn't see, did you suspect he was borrowing money on the side? No, but, no, not at all. By the way, were you dealing with loan sharks or reputable institutions? No, I didn't get as far as the loan sharks. I wasn't quite as bad as a lot of people that come into the program. You were bad enough. Luckily, I was only 8,000 in debt at the time. Uh, I've seen people come into the program 50, 100,000 in debt. I've run into people that's blown millions. Mm -hmm. uh, the money really it doesn't it doesn't matter if you blow a hundred dollars you can't afford or blow a hundred thousand you can't afford it's what it does to you did you ever see any results of a, any of the big wins he must have had on the odds over the years no as a matter of fact from all his years of gambling we really don't have anything to show yeah. You know, it's only since we've been in the program that things have... The beginning... ...are falling into place and we're doing really well. So you have 20 or 30 years of, of the chances of building up assets have been dissipated altogether, eh? Yes. And how did the... How many thousand members are there in Gaminon? <laughs> <laughs> well, there probably should be thousands. There's probably about seven or eight of us that come steady. That spouses. Yes. Or associated people. Yes. And what do you do? Do you just tolerate the gambling habit if, you're, if your husband is actively gambling or your partner is actively gambling at the time? What do you do? Do you try and convert them or do you Well, just... the first thing you learn when you, came, you come into the program is that you are powerless over the gambling problem. You know, and I think for years this is what I tried to do is to get my husband to stop gambling. You know, and I couldn't understand. He was a smart person. I couldn't understand why he just couldn't see what he was doing and quit when it was causing so many problems. Um, 
No, in Gammonon, we work on ourselves. We can't change the compulsive gambler and what he's doing if he chooses to gamble, but we can change ourselves and our reactions to what he's doing. In other words, you accept the things you cannot change. Yes. And the gambling of your partner until he makes a decision to stop is his problem. It's his problem. But you have to live with it. You have to live with a shortage of money or a nightmare over your head. Who knows what's going to happen to you financially? But you can live with it and go crazy, or you can come to gammon on and live with it and, and have, at least keep yourself healthy. And sane. And sane. But bringing up a family couldn't have been easy for your wife in those days. No, I'm sure it wasn't, Jack. Uh, I sure didn't help. But today, uh, unbelievably, uh, my children come and hug and kiss me and call me dad. And I was like a stranger to them when I was gambling. And uh, it's devastating to think of what I did to them. The time that I lost at gambling and didn't give to my children is unbelievable. And that they can call me dad and hug and kiss me today, uh, I've got to be grateful for that. It's really a kind of secret disease, isn't it? It is, very much so. You know, it's something, really, the only person that knows a person as a compulsive gambler is the person that is living with them or like a parent, someone that's very closely well, associated. Well, you can both relax now, secure in the knowledge you've got to beat them, correct? True or false? No, <laughs> I'm only one bet away from back at it. I can honestly say I'll have it the rest of my life, but today I don't choose to gamble. What happens tomorrow? I don't know yet. I hope I don't gamble, but that isn't here. Premier van der Zam argues for total abstinence in other areas. I wish he would not be such a hypocrite and also argue for total abstinence in state-organized gambling. People you've seen up to now were gambling legally, either in the clubs where there is a rake-off under the criminal code or uh, in other places. But I personally object to this this uh, campaign promising for all kinds of legalized gambling on the very straightforward opinion which every policeman in the country will confirm that you bring in big time gambling, you bring in skim, you bring in mafia, you bring in drugs, you bring in prostitution. And now, just don't forget, I've been talking both about Gamblers Anonymous and Gammonon, which is the kind of support organization for Gamblers Anonymous. But I want you to meet a friend of mine who is a horse racing addict. Just listen to him. And after that, I'll take some free-for-all calls on gambling in this segment. How much did you lose at the track in all your days? How much did you win? Maybe you were a good gambler. Oh, I don't think there's any good gambler around, but I... It's hard to put a figure on how much I lost. But, uh, what did you lose in your social life, though, over the years of all the years of your compulsive gambling? See, as a compulsive gambler, Jack, you, it's not only the time you spend gambling, it's the time you think about gambling. You think about which horse is going to win tomorrow, why did my horse lose yesterday. It's a 24-hour gamble. Mm -hmm. You don't have time for anything. Mm -hmm. you, your social life is, is, is zero. You, your friends uh, want nothing to do with you for a simple reason. All you talk about is, is the racetrack or gambling, for that matter. Mm -hmm. And certainly, uh, my uh, family life was... What happened to your uh, family? I was married. I had uh, three beautiful children. And uh, it came to the point where my wife just couldn't take it any longer. It just uh, came to the so absolute boiling point. Smashed where, your marriage? It, uh, I lost my marriage. What yes. about your assets and whatnot? Well, I had no assets whatsoever because everything I had was went into gambling. When did you start? I started gambling, I would say, when I was about 10, 11 years old. I remember my, my grandmother teaching me how to play cards so she could play cards with me for money. So, of course, I was cheating, so I had my, my pocket money for my grandmother right, because I beat her in the card game. But uh, I remember going to school, even throwing pennies against the wall and there. Uh, 
all this sort of stuff. And then when you... And then I, I came to Canada and somebody introduced me to horse racing. And that was the downfall. Mm -hmm. That's when I started, really became, I would say, a compulsive gambler. You would go to every meeting at the track. Every meeting at the track. I would find excuses to go. I would, with my wife, I would arrange an argument so I could storm out of the house so I could go to gambling. I would, uh, at business, I would book myself off to faint, you know, fake being sick or whatever. And, uh, you had a re reasonably good job most of these years? Uh, I always had a job. I always had a job. Uh, we need a job because we need money to gamble. But if you couldn't get it from work, you wouldn't get it from anywhere else, would you? I wrote bad checks. I cashed checks, knowing very well I didn't have money in the bank. I just, my th thinking was so bad that I would write a check to say for $500, convinced that I could go to the track at night and win this $500 to cover it in the bank. And of course, sometimes you succeeded. Very few times. So meanwhile, your wife is struggling by and what's left of your paycheck. That's right, but sometimes she never got it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes she never got it. You, how long have you not been gambling now? Okay, I've been in the program now for uh, since June 15th of last year. Oh, you're fairly new. I'm fairly new at it. And uh, you wouldn't believe what difference it makes. I have a bank account now, but besides that, what I'm regaining most of it is my self-respect. Mm -hmm. Because when you gamble like, like I did, you lose your self-respect totally. Mm -hmm. And when you have to go to the track in the last race, you have to bake somebody for 25 cents so you can make that last bet. I mean, that's it. That. You would do that? Oh, yes, and I'd, I can go to the racetrack with you today or t tomorrow and, and point out 500 other people who are doing the same thing. You mean $2 bets or $2,000 bets? It makes no difference, $2 or, or 2000 But if I didn't have, let's say, I had $1.75 left in my pocket, I needed to make that last bet. I had to get 25 cents from somewhere. And you'd beg it from a stranger? Of course. And sometimes, and they often get it from often, the guys often at the get track. it because those guys were in the same boat because they would come to you sometimes. And they, I need well, water. What was the watershed which said, I'm going to stop this? Was it, did you join Gamblers Anonymous? Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, I had a, I stole uh, quite a bit of money from my boss. Stole it? Stole it. And I mean literally stole it. Helped yourself? Helped myself. And uh, he turned out to be, I would say, the best friend I ever had in my life. Instead of throwing the book at me, he said, you need help. It took me another year and a half to realize finally that I wanted help. But the day I wanted help, I, was, I wanted help and I was crying out for help. And I got help at Cameras Anonymous. And I am an absolute vivid believer of it. So you think Gamble's yes. anonymous, plus the decent treatment from your employer who didn't yes. throw the book at you, right. finally made you see the light of day. See the light of day. So you're on a whole new track now, and not a race it's, track. That's right. It's a different ballgame altogether. Are the races on just now? Yes, they are. Do you want to go today? Not with me. I don't know if I made my point or not. I've got this personal predilection against government gambling. I think it's evil and a tax on the poor and it's a dreadful reputation for the country and the province altogether. No doubt about that. Now, if I've made my point, I might get support that I might be called stupid because everybody bets on Lotto 649, everybody bets on scratch and win, and all the old timers like the people you've seen tonight go to the racetrack and bet their heads out. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello, Jack. Yes. Uh, yeah, I have to agree with you 100%. I worked in Nevada in the gambling casinos for over 25 years oh. before moving to Vancouver in Canada here. And uh, the people that you see, the, the old age pensioners that cash their check and they come in just to win a few dollars to extend their check and they end up losing their whole check and that's a whole month of their life gone out of their life. And then the next month they come back because they have to make up for what they lost before. It's it's really atrocious to see the people that uh, lose their money, and not just the poor people. Uh, there's incidents that I've seen in the years that I was there, uh, working in Vegas, Reno, and other places. A uh, man that sold the pancake business. Uh, and lost a lot. 
Of, uh, he lost everything he had. I mean, he owned... Yeah, no, uh, but even bingo. When they were running bingo for charity in this town, there was many a night, I could name you one specific operation, where the charity lost $4,000 on the first night of bingo. It's a phony deal altogether. I'm telling you, I'm against it. Go ahead, please. Jack, um, my husband is a professional gambler. In a card club in Vancouver? Yeah. Yeah. And I resent, I resent the fact that, that these people that you have on, they, they automatically assume that gambling, drugs, sex, and all that are synonymous. They are not. And no. I've been around a lot of poker joints myself. No, gambling is synonymous with gambling. Big-time casino gambling is synonymous with other things. But card club gambling is straight gambling. Well, now, the fellow you had on was talking about his cocaine habit. He makes it sound like the gambling gave him his cocaine habit. Well, it may well have done. The cocaine habit gave him his gambling habit, and he's a loser. He's just a loser. He's a loser both ways. Well, he doesn't know how to play cards, for one thing, and he wants to blame it on... on... Oh, is your husband a successful gambler? Well, we live quite well, thank you. On the gambling? Well, I, I would consider him an entertainer. He's an entertainer. Some people, they use gambling as a form of entertainment. They get their paychecks, these straight guys, they want to go and they... Ah, he's a lucky gambler. Don't want to hear good news about gambling. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Jack, I just don't uh, agree with your argument. I think that it's, it's the same as alcohol. You know, there's lots of people who are heavy alcoholics, but you don't eliminate alcohol because of the bad apples. Maybe we should. Well, maybe we should, then we're going to have to rewrite society. Oh, I agreed with that. I'm merely saying that I'll accept what gambling is available under the criminal code right now, but I strongly object to, for instance, the question of using gambling for political patronage, which is quite common in British Columbia. The profits from gambling generally go to the constituencies of the governments in power. Okay, well, I, I don't know about that, but I just know myself personally, I'll take a $20 bill and I'll go to a casino. You're controlled. I can have an evening's entertainment and maybe, maybe I'll lose $20, maybe I'll come out and I'll win $20, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't think that um, you should be eliminating that pleasure for me just because there's a few people that ruin their lives over it. Well, personally, I wouldn't mind eliminating your pleasure on it. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Jack, I was wondering if you could do me a real big favor here. Uh, I agree with your premise as far as the big-time gambling goes uh, in, re in regards to the organized crime, uh, prostitution, etc. Would you do me a real big favor? The next time you have someone from the government on trying to explain the reasons for it, would you please turn your back on them like you did another politician, please? You mean Sven Robinson? Exactly. Because of their hypocrisy? Exactly. Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next time Brian Smith is here, I'll get him to explain the hypocritical attitude of the very moral social credit government, but with changes when it comes to gambling, which I think is an abomination, government gambling. Go ahead, please. Yes, good evening, Jack. Yeah, I'd like to point out that people that do go down to uh, Nevada, Reno, and Las Vegas and such have the money to have the money to go down there to gamble in the first place. It's not like it's next door and you could go anytime you want. Well, I'd say let them go to Nevada. I so do I. So do I. I agree with you. And not bring it up here. Certainly not. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hello. You're not there. Yeah, uh, Jack? Yeah, that's you. Waking up. No, he doesn't understand. Go ahead, please. Mr. Webster. Yes, sir. I, I, I agree with one of your earlier callers in that these people have a problem with gambling and they can't control themselves. I mean, it's like saying we should get rid of credit cards because of compulsive shoppers or we should shut down the liquor stores because of alcoholics. I mean, these people are weak and they can't control themselves and they're looking for something to blame it on. You have a good point, I must confess. I just object to the government's participation in opening up gambling to a larger area with all the concomitant evils that ally themselves with gambling. Well, it's the same story as the control of liquor stores. I'm glad that the government controls it, so at least the public is getting some of the social costs back from it. I'd rather the government control it than the mafia or whatever kind, other kind of group. Well, I agree have. with you on that, but the way Mr. Van der Zam is talking in Ottawa today, he looks like he's going to sell everything, not just the liquor stores, but the BC ferries as well, if he can get the right price for it. Go ahead from Cranbrook. Okay, I'd just like to echo the sentiments of a couple of your earlier callers. 
uh, they've suggested to you that maybe you're spending too much time trying to protect British Columbians from their own problems. <laughs> like, I'd like to think that nine out of ten people are going to be able to discipline themselves to a point where maybe a little bit of gambling and a few free zones across the province can't hurt us all. Well, I'm merely pointing out the dangers for ill-disciplined, compulsive people like myself. Uh, you've, they've already shown you that without gambling within this province, they've already been able to damage themselves. There's enough out there for us to mess ourselves up on. I like to think that there are some positive aspects to gambling-free zones within the province, especially at a time when our little natural resources aren't really helping us out. Let's In other words, we've got, instead of a proud uh, province with resources and secondary industry, we've got to become a tourist Valhalla sitting on the doorstep selling scratch and win tickets and lottery tickets and cheap casino gambling to the tourists who are very kind to come to our somewhat impoverished province. I don't go along with that at all. One more call. Go ahead, please. Okay, why are we always looking at Nevada as the bellwether of what happens in gambling? Look at Atlantic City. Why don't you look at what happens in England and in Australia, where gambling is controlled strictly by the government? Why do we always have to attach drugs and prostitution with gambling? It's not necessarily so. Don't use Nevada as a bellwether. Gambling takes place in lots of places in the world, and it doesn't come with drugs and prostitution have you and all seen, the rest of the crap I hear all the time. Have you seen the disgusting denizens of gambling throughout the United Kingdom? They're, They're not dreadful disgusting dens. Yes, they are. Be controlled. And don't tell me it's, it's disgusting uh, dens and it works on prostitution and drug rape. Not in prostitution, but... I go, worked there for years. You I'm go into the bookie something. shops in England and Scotland. I've been go into in the England and I've been in Scotland there. and I've worked there for years. I think they're abominable. I'm a professional, I'm a professional uh, dealer. I'm a fresh, professional inspector in a casino in Great Britain. I know how it's controlled there. It's got nothing to do with drugs or prostitution. Absolutely nothing. If you get too many traffic tickets there, you don't work in the casino business. Period. Well, you're better in Britain than we are here. You go to Atlantic City and have a look at that disgusting place. Well, we got some life to the program tonight. I must take another call. <laughs> go ahead from Aldergrove. Hello, Mr. Webster? Yeah. Well, you're talking about gambling and all this that drives people crazy. How about the racetrack? The Parimutuel is one of the great crazy drivers in the whole country. The what? The Parimutuel. Is what? And is it is one of the places where the gamblers are complaining that the government takes far too big a cut, as I recall. Oh, they take about five times bigger cut on 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 the lottos. Well, on the lottos, they take fifty percent plus. Yeah, on the racetrack, they take about eight. No, it's but more than that. And the racetrack creates a lot of unemployment. Uh, employment. Well, horse racing is like liquor. It's deeply embedded in our society. The point I'm trying to make is I don't want to see a government whose object in life is to encourage and develop legalized government-run casinos in British Columbia to the shame and damnation of the ordinary people. I'll be back after the break. I don't know if I can get off the gambling calls, but by absolute happenstance and sheer coincidence, I've got here tonight Harry Atkinson, the director of the Debtor Assistance Branch of Consumer and Corporate Affairs. And Harry, I was going to have you here to help people to get out of trouble, but if I'm a gambler and I'm bankrupt and broke, can you help me? Well, certainly. We, uh, we can step between you and your creditors, uh, at least uh, solve some of the problems on, on a short-term basis. Now, really, in fact, we've got 200,000 people unemployed, in British Columbia, with a lot of people in financial trouble, is your department still getting and giving the same service you used to give in orderly payment of debts, garnishes, and all the rest of that stuff? Certainly, our uh, our debtor assistance program is is still in in full full flight. Where uh, we've got uh, the same number of counselors as we had before. We have uh, four offices in the province, and we're providing services for people who are having financial problems. How uh, much has business gone up? How much has the <laughs> demand for service gone up, though? Well, it's it's particularly heavy right now. As a matter of fact, in Vancouver, we're, we're booked up three weeks in advance in terms of appointments to get in to see a counselor. So the demand is there, uh, certainly, but uh, we are coping with it, and uh, we are dealing with all the emergent problems. Uh, we are uh, But if I've got no money, you can't really help me. If I own, if I owe $3,500 and I'm out of work and unemployment insurance, what can you do to help me? 
One of the main my creditors yeah. are pressing me like mad. Mm -hmm. One of the main things I guess we do is to explain people's rights and responsibilities, to sit down and try to put their, their mind at ease in exactly what, what rights they do have in the face of, of creditor presser, pressure, in the face of, of harassment, this sort of thing. So those are the things we can do. We can help people deal with these, these critical issues. What right do I have? I owe the money, I signed the contract, I can't pay it. They can send these horrible bailiffs up to seize mm -hmm. whatever I had bought, can't they? In certain instances, they can. If, if they have a secured interest, uh, certainly they can come and, and attempt to, to seize. But everybody has the right, first of all, to, to have the courts look at, at, at a, a situation of this nature. Someone can't seize a good from you unless they have a security interest in it or have a judgment uh, and it's being seized through the courts. So uh, certainly you have some rights. And our program has the, the statute authority to go ahead and, and issue a court order binding creditors to accept uh, what a debtor is able to pay, what they can afford to pay. Well, give me that. Supposing I owe this uh, $5,000, we'll say, and I can't pay a, a number of things, including my mortgage. I come to you. What do you do for me? I've well, got two charge accounts. I've got Visa. I've got Master Charge. I've got a department store. And I'm six months behind on my mortgage, and I owe another $5,000. What can you do for me? Well, what we do, first of all, I guess, is to stop the noise in church in terms of the unsecured creditors, the department stores, this sort of thing. We try to issue a court order binding them and holding them aside until we made arrangements with the mortgage company to bring it back up to date. This might include a report to the court under the Debtor Assistance Act uh, recommending that uh, the, the creditor accept perhaps a payment and a half over the next few months until the mortgage is in good standing. And then we'll start working on the rest of the creditors. Each, but, but, each, each circumstance is, is unique and it's... But I can come to you and you will take action on my behalf. Absolutely. That's what we're there for. That's why people pay the taxes and, and we're there to earn our, our keep. Well, that's really quite good. Supposing, for instance, I'm being harassed. In the bad old days when I used to do a lot of this stuff, bailiffs had some very bad habits. Bailiffs used to appear with phony papers, pretending they were court summonses, force their way into houses, seize goods mm. without lawful authority. Has that long since been stopped? Yes, it has. It has. We, uh, as a matter of fact, our, our complaints regarding bailiffs and collection agencies have been dropping drastically over the last four or five years. Uh, a major reason for that is we keep records on exactly which ones are having complaints against them and if, if there's a lot of them or if they're severe, if there's any indication of physical violence, they're not in business anymore. And uh, we, we invite them in to give us reasons why they, they, they should still have a license. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's working very effectively. By and large, the industry is very responsible and we're quite pleased with the way they're I remember reacting. an act being changed years ago whereby, and many people used to complain about it, I might be phoned at my place of work four or five times a day to my embarrassment, which might cause me to lose my job. Does that still happen? Very seldom. Uh, we still have a few of those complaints. When we receive those complaints, we act on them immediately. We get in touch with the collection agent, the, the collector. If he repeats it in the face of our warnings, his license is gone. He's not in business anymore. What about personal bankruptcy? If I just cannot cope with uh, what I owe, can you help me or will you merely advise me on how to go into personal bankruptcy? We'll interview, uh, we'll take a look at the circumstances, we'll try to uh, provide an alternative to bankruptcy because that's why we're there. We, we don't want people going bankrupt that don't absolutely need that sort of assistance. However, bankruptcy is there to relieve and identify a person from uh, an unbear unbearable debt load. So if that's the, the, the only solution to the problem, we'll explain your rights, explain the procedures, we'll direct you to a, a trustee and help you toward the, the remedy that you need. How much does it cost me? I've got to put money up front to go into personal bankruptcy, haven't I? Well, not necessarily. Uh, there's a, a program that is run by the, the federal government, uh, the people who license bankruptcy trustees, that in certain instances a person can go bankrupt without having any money, $50 or less, mm -hmm. depending on the social and economic need of the situation. Like I say, the BC Insolvency Association have responded very well and are providing these services in, in cases of extreme One need. of your principal methods of helping is arranging the orderly payment of debts. Yes. And when you do that, does that freeze the interest of the debts at a certain level? <sighs> That's right. It's a, it's a judgment, and judgments bear interest at the rate of 5%, so that gives an individual some hope of getting out of debt within a reason, reasonable period of and time. And your department can issue such a judgment? Absolutely. Uh, we have four clerks of the court that are able to do this throughout the province and again, encourage people to pay consistent with their ability. One other question. Uh, occasionally I get a phone call from somebody who is on welfare who says they're being harassed to make payments. Do people on welfare have to make payments on debts? 
That's uh, an interesting situation. There's, there's case law on it that uh, if that's their only form of income and if uh, a collector harasses them uh, for payments, uh, obviously the public interest is that we don't give people money on welfare. Uh, uh, that is, the government doesn't give them money uh, on welfare to give to creditors. So uh, a recent case, uh, a collection agent was, was sued. Uh, for harassing someone for money when their only income was, was social assistance and was successful in recovering a judgment in the first instance for $250 and on appeal it was raised to $1,000 against the collection agency. Well, I'm glad to hear you're still active, you know. I really uh, am because it was one of the really good programs put in many, many years ago. How many? Uh, 1974, so we're 12 years now, uh, 14 years. Your questions to Harry Atkinson, who is the... What's your full title? Consumer Director of Consumer Credit well, and Debtor Assistance Branch. It's recently changed. It's uh, Director Debtor Assistance Branch, and uh, oh. so it's rather less confusing. Are you still in Consumer and Corporate Affairs or the nope. Finance Ministry? Labor and Consumer Services. The Ministry of Labor and Consumer Services. He looks after it. Yep. Your calls to Harry Atkinson after the break. Harry Atkinson, Director of Debtor Assistance Branch of the Provincial Government. Mike, it's a misery now, eh? Mm. Go ahead, please. Yes, gentlemen, my question to the Director is uh, concerning a person with a garnishee who gets paid twice a month. Uh, and it seems that a person who gets into that kind of a situation is under the gun to start with. And here they, they go, to, go to whatever they do to get a court order, cost them bailiff fees, and all of this is added on to this guy's debt. It takes him twice as long to pay off the debt as he would have otherwise been able to do. Is this, uh, it seems to me something should be done about this. Well, basically, the, uh, this is what we're interested in, in doing. If you come to a debt counselor, they will try to mediate that and get it out of the courts. Uh, Jack didn't mention it, but we have something like 1,500 ongoing uh, families uh, using our service. And each one of those uh, under the orderly payment of debts represents about eight creditors. That's approximately 12,000 claims that could be before the courts if our branch wasn't there. So the, the issue that you bring up, sir, is, is exactly this. We like to intervene, mediate, get that thing out of the courts. If it's a matter of ability for payment, that's not a matter for the courts. Uh, ability for payment is something that belongs in the hands of a debt counselor to try to work out an arrangement that's, that's fair with, to, to all your creditors. But if a guy has garnished me, I'm stuck with a garnished You can't help me, can you? Oh, certainly. Because the garnished is only good once each time it's issued. So he, he's got to be garnished each week. After the first garnishee, he should be in our office so that we can contact that creditor and say, look, let's put an arrangement in place to stop the garnishments. They were hitting him with something like $37 or $25 or $40 every time they issued a garnishee. Yeah, uh, the cost. Adding to the debt. That's, like I say, this is the sort of thing that belongs in the hands of a debt counselor. And our statute authority is the orderly payment of debts where we are able to negotiate and get that out of the court system. Did, I, did I say that everybody with a garnishee who can't afford to meet it should come to you? Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Or we'll, we'll negotiate on their behalf. Now, we suggest they try to help themselves, but if they can't, if they can't negotiate and mediate their way out, that's what our counselors are there for. That's what you pay taxes for, and that's why we're trying to help. The number's up there, 660-3550. That'll drive you crazy in the morning. <laughs> my, Go staff, ahead. my staff will be very proud of me. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yes, hello. Yes. Yes, uh, I was wondering if your services are... I have two questions. Uh, one would be, uh, I... I'm in a position where I'm having some difficulties with some financing, but I'm not quite in the jaws of the creditor yet. Uh, I was just wondering, do you have services available to sort of, you know, preempt any strike that they might make towards me or give me some assistance on that matter? Uh, and my second question would be, uh, what do you know about these companies that are uh, sort of financial agencies that are in the business of just loaning money, money you know, to just sort of... To consolidate debts. Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, yeah, some of these consolidation loans are, are very uh, uh, reasonable. If you can consolidate at a lower rate than you're paying right now, you may have three or four credit cards with, say, department stores, and you're able to roll it together on a line of credit at 12%. Yeah, but that's just it. You see, the interest rate on this particular, I won't name the company, but uh, mm -hmm. it's at about 26.7%. 
well, then you have to shop for a better credit rating. But the other issue that you brought up is, can you come in and talk to a counselor? Well, certainly you should, because if you're going to go and negotiate with your creditors or even apply for a loan, you should have all of the information before you go in. If you're going to negotiate, the first rule is prepare yourself. Make sure you have enough information to, to be fair and, and be able to deal on an equal footing with your creditors. It just strikes me, if you're paying a department store 28%, which is not unusual on a credit card, hmm. You might have more assets than you realize to borrow from the bank at whatever. I at, see. So absolutely. the number will be up again, I presume. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Thank and, you. And you should shop. The number will be up again. Go ahead, please. Yes, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, I would like to know, after one has uh, declared personal bankruptcy, uh, what are the long-term effects? Uh, you know, how long does that stay with your record? I'll hang up now and uh, listen to your call. Well, the, the Credit Reporting Act says that uh, that will remain on your record for six years. However, there is uh, something you can do about that. It may be on your record, but you can go down to the Credit Bureau, ask to see your file, see what's on there, and if the, if the bankruptcy is reported, put a statement on of 100 words or less describing ex exactly why it happened. Now, bankruptcies sometimes occur for reasons beyond your control, illness. Uh, something happened in your life that you couldn't control and you had an unbearable debt load. In circumstances like that, your creditors should know about that so that anybody accessing your credit file can take a look at it and say, yes, he was bankrupt, but he was bankrupt because of a business failure in 1982, which wasn't unusual during that period of time. Yeah, that's good. And I can go down to the credit uh, reporting bureau and look at it. Absolutely. absolutely. Without charge. Without charge. Just to charge you money, not anymore. Yeah, the, the credit bureau will disclose to you, and, and uh, they're, they're, they're doing a tremendous job in that area. The, uh, the credit bureaus that are in the province are, are living within the legislation and doing a fine job in that area. Go ahead, please. Good evening, Jack, uh, and I enjoy your show very much. Good. I uh, went through the orderly payment of debts plan uh, some years ago. My options were down to the point of personal bankruptcy, and I have to... Just, I just want to say that this saved my life. It, uh, I didn't go through um, personal bankruptcy. They gave me a 50 cent on the dollar uh, judgment. I managed to get rid of my debts in that way and have uh, since become a little more... Uh, Financially viable. Are you praising Harry Atkinson's department? Yes, I am. I think it is a fantastic... Uh, mm -hmm program and I recommend it to anybody who uh, gets in over their head to the point uh, where they are contemplating personal bankruptcy. Thank you, thank you. Take a bow, thank Harry. <laughs> thank you. Go ahead, please. Yes, I had a business last year that, uh, and unfortunately it didn't work out after 10 months. And of course now I have several debts and I tried to go back to my bank to consolidate my debts, but they couldn't help me. So I'm just wondering if uh, this gentleman can uh, you know, arrange something or suggest something that can help me now because in the meantime I have, uh, of course, uh, uh, paying very high interest and of course through the bank it would be much less. So uh, if I came in to see him, uh, this is what I'd like to know what he could do for me. Well, I don't know exactly what we can do for you, but we can tell you what your rights are. We can put a program in place that's going to allow you to pay your debts consistent with your ability over a reasonable period of time. I, and we can do it notwithstanding the fact that your credit, you may not be able to obtain uh, a loan to consolidate everything. First of all, we like people to solve their own problems. Secondly, we, we like to refer them back to the credit industry. And by the way, that's a two-way street. Over 40% of the clients we see are referred to us by the credit industry themselves. So we're pretty popular and, and they will go along with any arrangement, any reasonable arrangement that we put forward. I think what you should do, make an appointment, come down, see a counselor, discuss your specific details, your specific circumstances, and I'm sure that we can do something to, to help out. One brief call. Yes, Mr. Wester. Yes. Um, I, I declared personal bankruptcy and I had everything wiped out except for my debt that is owed to the government, which is ICBC. Um, I'm having to make payments on this. I was told if I wanted to do something about it, no. to take it to court. Just a minute, we'll have to finish that off there. My thanks to Harry Atkinson, director of the Debt and Assistance Plans. Put his number up again, please. 660-3550. Want to okay. keep the staff busy tomorrow. <laughs> and I'll be back after the break. Well, tomorrow I'm doing a story. It's not gruesome, but it's about the Pacific organ retrieval for transplantation and the big push there's on to get your bits and pieces when you finally go to that great studio in the sky. And other things tomorrow at 5 p.m. precisely. <laughs>